Um, so kia ora, welcome. My name is Alina Siegfried and I'm a freelance storyteller. Um, and I've had the great pleasure in the last few months of taking a really deep dive into regenerative agriculture in New Zealand um, and talking to those who are involved in the movement, um, people who are working on the land, so some of the farmers, um, some who are working more in the business space and then others who are working in the scientific space, which will be a little bit more of uh, the focus of today's discussion. Um, so yes, yeah, so just to give you a bit of a, a background and then I'll introduce today's speakers. Um, this, our Regenerative Future series was um, something that we started talking about when I was still working with Edmonton Fellowship last year um, to highlight some of the stories of the EHF fellows that were engaged in regenerative agriculture. Um, but then, yeah, we got talking with Pure Advantage who were also looking to do something around regen ag and soil um, carbon sequestration um, and a lot of alignment between the two organizations in terms of um, driving innovation and looking at alternatives for New Zealand um, and building a bit more, um, I guess, of a reality around our clean green image in, from overseas. Um, so got chatting and decided to co-produce a series, which has resulted in a 15-part content series, which you can check out online through either Pure Advantage or the Edmund Tillery Fellowships blog on Medium. And really got to dive deep with um, a lot of the farmers and the others that are involved in this in New Zealand. Um, so out of that has come this, this webinar series. And this is episode three of um, an original six. It looks like we might be tacking a couple of extra ones on the end there as well. So they'll be in the following Mondays. Um, just briefly before we introduce our speakers, I will uh, give a shout out to the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, um, which is a, a global network of both Kiwi and international um, people who are interested in systems change and positive impact. So it could be entrepreneurs, farmers, artists, investors, um, different kind of innovators, um, there's literally in any kind of profession in there. They've got their, uh, I think, final opportunity to apply for the Global Impact Visa, um, closing in 36 hours. So you can apply for Cohort 8 um, within the next 36 hours. And um, as I understand it, that's, that's the final opportunity at that, um, at that fellowship at this point. Um, so get in there if that's of interest to you. EHF.org is where you go for details. Um, I think now we will crack into uh, talking a little bit about today's session, which is on soil ecology and regenerative soil science. And uh, we're very lucky to have two of our amazing contributors to the Our Regenerative Future series with us today. Um, we've got Nicole Masters and uh, Gwen Grillet, Dr. Gwen Grillet from, from Landcare Research as well. Um, I'll ask them to introduce themselves in a moment, but we'll just take a quick look at these poll results. Um, it looks like we've got almost half of the people on the call today are farmers or growers themselves, which is fantastic. Um, great to see people with boots on the ground here. Um, but we've got a few people from business and media, science and academia. Um, most people have read at least some of the stories in the series, which is fantastic. So you'll have a bit of a grounding of, of, this, um, of this series. And most people are at least um, somewhat or very familiar with regenerative agriculture, which is a fantastic starting point for, um, for diving into our discussion today. So if you've got questions, you can submit them through the Q&A box, which you can access in that bottom bar. Please use that box um, rather than the uh, chat function. And you can also upvote questions in, um, in that box too. If you see something that uh, you'd love to hear a little bit more about, then you can throw an upvote on there as well. Wonderful. Um, thank you again for joining us um, today, particularly because it is a holiday. I appreciate that you've all taken time out of your Queen's birthday, or for those of you in New Zealand anyway. Um, to join this exciting conversation. So I think at this stage, I will hand over to Nicole Masters and um, invite you to introduce yourself. Nicole, over to you. Hi, Alina. Thanks for pulling this together and um, inviting Gwen and I to this session. It's fantastic. So yeah, my name's Nicole Masters. I'm an agroecologist, which means I'm really angry about ecology. No, it means that uh, I have a background in soil science and ecology and uh, 
I work with land owners and managers around Australia, New Zealand and North America, <clears throat> really looking at how do we bring ecological principles to agriculture and um, bring vibrant life back to landscapes. Primarily, I've been involved in education for the last uh, 17 years and working as a consultant for 14 of those years or a coach. So yeah, that's a, that's a quick background. Wonderful. Thanks, Nicole. I'm sure we'll get to dive a little bit more into your experiences throughout the conversation. Um, Gwen, over to you. Hi, uh, Kelda. Um, well, thanks for having me here. This is a great privilege and uh, it's been really good fun actually talking with you and interacting with everybody that's worked at putting this series together. I've actually learned a lot myself. Um, so um, I, I had my, uh, I'm, I'm a soil ecologist and uh, I uh, won a PhD in 2002 as a plant ecophysiologist, which is defined as looking at the physiology of the plant in itself. So you're looking only at how the plant behave in isolation uh, from everything else around it. And after the PhD, I uh, realized I was missing out on quite a lot of interaction that might have affected what was going on within the plant. And this is when I started to um, pay attention to mycosal fungi and I became an expert in particular type of mycosal fungi um, and realized that when you start to study an organism you have to take into account the organism that interact with it and just to cut the story short as I grew into my career I realized that each time I looked at one particular part of the system I was missing out on everything that was around it and I was driving, deriving conclusions that were possibly uh, not necessarily accurate or uh, a reflection of what was going on because I wasn't able to describe that part, how it was con uh, in the way it was functioning with everything else around it. So my career grew like this and um, and this is, um, that then took me to understand how um, soil ecology and, and soil biota interact with the rest of the community uh, above ground, below ground, and even bigger how the soil biology is supported and uh, manipulated by the humans and the decision that the humans make. Um, and if we don't take all of this into account, we're kind of somewhat uh, possibly uh, deriving some conclusions that are um, not necessarily a true reflection of what's going on. Now, the problem is how do we do that? Because those are complex systems and this is what I'm, I've been trying to do in the last three or four years. When I met Nicole um, and started to really pay much, much more attention to this movement of relative agriculture, it seems to be very aware and mindful of the complexity of system. And that's what drew me to it. And I'm French uh, in origin, so um, I will try my <laughs> hardest. <laughs> Thanks. It's wonderful to have a bit of international flavor on the call. Nicole is calling in um, today from Montana. Which is 36 degrees today. Woo. Fair bit warmer than Wellington today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Hey, thank you both for that introduction. Um, I think we'll start with, I'd love to just explore what regenerative agriculture means to both of you, how you would describe it. Because it's a question that we get quite a lot and there's a fair bit of misunderstanding out there about what it is and what it isn't and, and different, um, yeah, different factions of it. So I'd love to put that question to you both. You start, Nico? Oh, oh yeah, I start. Oh, I was about I to start. say, you go, Gwen. You go. <laughs> All right. So, um, my my own um, uh, kind of it's not a definition, but it's a description of what relative egg is 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 the the child of a lot of um, uh, agricultural management strategies that rely on uh, biology and whole ecosystem understanding. So um, it's uh, the child of um, permaculture biodynamic as well as organic agriculture, um, agroecology, ecologically intensive agriculture, um, all of these um, holistic grazing management, all of these um, way of thinking about managing the landscape such that one always uh, thrive to maximize 
loads of different outcomes at once. So not just your productivity or not just your brain quality or whatever. And for me, that's the definition or that's a kind of a more uh, kind of setting the boundaries of a box in which we can start thinking about Reganag. So the key thing is this concept of looking at the whole system and managing for multiple outcomes. Yeah, and I think that's what <clears throat> the challenge has been. And I think that's what the opportunity is around defining regenerative agriculture is that it is so difficult to pin down because we're talking about outcomes and we're talking about principles as opposed to a very clear and defined practices. You know, you must do this or you can't do that. Whereas it, you know, how do we bring um, and restore bring more vibrancy, bring more health and diversity and have systems that work and that it encompasses, you know, human wellness and well-being as well as, you know, water quality, greenhouse gases, nutrient density, um, you know, all of this picture is, are we in a system that you could say, actually in a thousand years, we could still be farming this way. And I think if we looked at a lot of uh, the industrial model, which is very degenerative, no, we're not going to be able to continue to do this for the next thousand years, probably not even in the next uh, 20 years. So um, I kind of like that it's difficult to define. And I know that the marketing people and the funding agencies and the scientists want to have it really pinned down and clear. But I actually think that that closes down innovation. And right now we're in that very innovative birthing phase, like Gwen talks about it as a child. Um, you know, we really, we were taking the best of microbiology and it's just so much new science coming through as well as the best of management practices and, and it's an evolving space. And, and the other way it's really interesting how you can already pick up the difference with the conditioning of the academic and scientific lens looking at formatting whereas Nicole was straight into outcome. This is for me this is really telling. I, I'm totally amazed whenever I interact with many people like this that you um, and this is reflected in how people think about Reganag and, and the, the views and perspective they have on it. You can look at it from this other uh, angle, which a lot of people are flagging up, which is we had this craze of sustainable agriculture. And what's the difference between sustainable agriculture and regenerative agriculture? And so for taking my ecological hat on, um, and for me, you could, again, formatting, that could be a, a hybrid between restorative ecology and sustainable agriculture. So the idea is not just to do what we are doing right now and keep doing it forever because what we are doing right now, we know in many places doesn't work or is, is harmful for certain aspects of, of the system. So how do we manage to continue to produce food and manage our landscape, but also repair whatever is not working? And so then comes all of the questions, you know, how do you define what is not working, what is working, and et cetera? And how do you define whether, or how do you assess whether you've repaired it or not repaired it? And that's, that's where the science comes in. And some, some. Got it. Yeah, so there's that, there's that important distinction between what is sustainable and what is regenerative. And I love the points there, Nicole, about taking a very long-term view, which um, we're not actually very good at. <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of what we hear is that, um, you know, from those who say we don't need this in New Zealand is that a lot of farming in New Zealand already is regenerative by nature. So I'd love to just ask that question um, that's come through on the chat. Um, what would the panelists say to the argument that New Zealand's traditional sheep and beef farming with ripe grass and white clover pastures is naturally regenerative? Uh, I think if that was true, then we wouldn't be seeing the outcomes that we're seeing in terms of water quality. Um, there is certainly some interesting conversations around some of the nutrient density of some of our foods. But I think if we're talking about ryegrass and clover, we're not talking about diversity. We're not talking about deep rooting systems. We're talking about plants that have been commercially grown to be on very short rotational systems. Um, yeah, it, for me, that's not regenerative. And there's also some links to, to animal well-being from just feeding them a very narrow diet. So only feeding them ryegrass and clover is actually, um, I think we're going to see more conversations around humane animal treatment. And if you're only feeding two types of food or then you're feeding them um, like a winter brassica, you know, actually is that the best thing for animal health and performance? Mm. Got it. Queen, anything to add there? Yeah, there is. So this is a really interesting conversation and very polarizing because there is uh, the, 
there is no denial that the the way uh, beef and and sheep and lamb meat, for example, is produced in New Zealand outdoors is so much better for the environment than feedlot produced meat. There is absolutely, I mean, nobody's ever thinking of arguing this is not the case. So the, the issue is, yes, what we are doing here in New Zealand is so much better than many other places in the world. However, could we get better? And this is where that question for me, this is one of the questions that frustrates me a lot of the time in our experience in my profession. It's, this is not, the status quo is just not enough. Can we get better at what we are doing? So when I, when I go and, and I go hill walking and I, and I, and I you know, walk in, in the pastures and I, and I see that, um, you know, whenever there's, there's rain falling, um, all the paths are, are completely destroyed because the soil doesn't hold. Um, and there's a huge amount of soil erosion. Um, and yes, there, there is natural um, geologically uh, driven soil erosion because New Zealand is a really, really young country but the management of our pastures is really contributing a lot to it. Um, and this is just talking about, you know, um, sheep and beef, but start talking about dairy and overload of nitrogen, for example. Um, this is like, um, you know, New Zealand is the, the fourth highest usage of fertilizer per unit um, surface area in the world way, way above any, you know, the UK, the United States, France. Uh, so for me, this, this kind of conversation are kind of a little bit stale when people are not prepared to acknowledge that we do have, there are practices that we are doing that are not really optimal and can we do better? Yes, we're doing great compared to other places, but can we really do better if we want to still be there in 1000 years or 2000 years? Yeah, I love, I love the long-term, the long-term outlook there. Um, perhaps we can just dive a little bit into um, what regenerative agriculture actually is seeking to do with the soil and some of the issues that we have in soil in New Zealand and, and how Regen Ag can help. So what are, the, what are the actual measures of soil quality that, that you're looking at and looking to optimise? Well, Gwen brought up the, the water issue, you know, and it's interesting to sample around New Zealand. We really see that there's a breakdown in the water cycle and not only... Um, like you know water absorption but also a slow water release so we don't kind of get these flash flood drought kind of conditions that we're seeing globally and and so when we do infiltration tests on properties that are not practicing these practices then it's taking nearly an hour if not longer on some of these properties to absorb an inch of water and so what that means is that water maybe if you get a small amount it's going to evaporate but it also means that we become very very prone to drought so that would be one thing around soil when if you wanted to add another one yeah, so what um, I guess we, we, we have a, a, a Nicole and I are complementary and have a slightly different focus. My training and I want to understand what's going on. Like I'm fascinated by, by this new movement. Um, it's a lot of time, um, some of the, um, I would say claims, I don't want to offend anyone. I'm just saying claim for the sake of addressing the scientific community, for example. Um, and if you talk to farmers and, and you tell them these are only claims and their livelihood is at stake and they know very well that their system is working, it's really offensive to use that word. But for the purpose of science, there hasn't been a really, really solid science um, measuring what's going on. And so that's what fascinates me. And a lot of the things that I have started to deploy in my research was to look at, say, um, Yes, the water cycle. How do we best assess what's going on with the water? So doing the, the water infiltration rate and then pushing it beyond. Can we look at what's going on with the soil aggregate? Um, can we look at where the carbon goes within this different fraction of the soil aggregate? And what's the role of carbon in, in, in holding the soil? And then looking at the soil biology, how, how important is it to have a balance of all sorts of different uh, um, type of biota in your soil? Um, so the concept of the soil food web uh, has been developed by um, uh, multiple, multiple input into this concept. One that is really uh, pure academic and uses all sorts of very fancy technique to assess it like EDNA and so on, which is what I've, I've started to do. And then you have another uh, strain of um, 
tools that's been developed initially by Ellen Ingham, which is at the moment uh, not at all uh, regarded as being rigorous by the classic academic scientific community. But the farmers are using this test to indicate uh, whether their system is, is trending towards a balanced ecosystem below ground. And when they are making their decision in terms of management, they are seeing success. So from my point of view, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, where is it that we have a gap in our knowledge? How can we try and put all of these pieces together to better understand what's going on and then to make much more informed decision to where we could do whatever practices we could implement. And the other thing is in terms of the phosphorus and nitrogen cycle, there's so much assumption that we are making and, um, and reg the regenerative ag movement is really pushing and pushing the boundaries in terms of those assumptions. The, the currently um, accepted assumptions are being very questioned, very much questioned by the organic community and it's fascinating to watch it. Mm. Yes, yeah, certainly a very yeah. timely um, topic at the moment, the, the drought that we've, a lot of uh, farmers have been experiencing in the Hawke's Bay and, and up north. Um, <clears throat> Queen, I'd, I'd like to just dive a little bit more into um, how, you, how you manage to study something like regenerative agriculture, which very much takes a whole systems approach um, as a scientist, um, when a lot of the focus in the science community is, is quite reductionist in, in terms of studying just, just one thing. So what, what is the approach that you take? So there are, I'm taking multiple approaches and I have to, and I have to be really uh, crystal clear and, and transparent here. I have just started to build this research portfolio. So um, there are a few other scientists in the world that are starting to do the research on re regenerative agriculture per se. Um, so the, the science, uh, the all encompassing science is actually new. So we can't say that uh, I've been there for 20 or 30 years doing the science, just taking the whole system, right? So the difference is there's been quite a few, like actually hundreds and thousands of papers looking at individual practices that are deployed in Reagan Ag and looking at what could be the effect of these individual practices. And that is for me taking a reductionist approach where you say comparing uh, no-till versus tilling or uh, rotational grazing uh, versus uh, strip grazing or whatever. Okay, so each time um, the focus is on very much controlling what are the different practices that are being used and comparing the different treatment. Regan Ag is using all of these different practices, constantly adapting, constantly being responsive to what's going on with the system. So what we've been doing and what others have been doing is not trying to compare practices A versus another kind of practice, but, but taking the whole management as a whole and just trying to uh, factor out or control as much as possible the inherent environmental viability. So we've been um, taking a comparative approach where we are uh, looking at a farm that is regeneratively managed versus a farm that is managed using best current practice. And we're trying, where we are sampling, we're trying to match the soil type, the topography, everything that is in the physical environment is the same. So that's one approach. And this is the one that I've, start, I've managed to get funding for and I've started. The other approach that we've been thinking of is not at all trying to do a comparison because comparison assumes this black and white. So it's either regenerative or not regenerative. And actually this is totally incorrect because even within the best current practice, there are some management strategies that lead towards some regeneration in some, some element and uh, some, some outcomes and vice versa. Some of the regenerative practitioners haven't really fully optimized their system. And there are still things that they are doing that are potentially degenerative. So instead of taking this black and white approach, which is also, again, still slightly looking at reality through the lens, reductionist lens, would be more taking a, a gradient. So measuring quite a range of key variable of a, of a large range of variation within your agroecosystem. These haven't managed to secure funding yet. If there are any funders listening to this, uh, please contact me after the end of this talk. That was my pitch. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. You heard it first here, folks. There's, a, there's an investment <laughs> opportunity for you. Um, 
Uh, did you have anything you wanted to add there, Nicole? No, that's great. Okay. I think that's, I mean, that's a really interesting place to um, head into a question from Jim Bennett that's come through in the chat, just around the, um, the, def the way we, that we use definitions in New Zealand and uh, regenerative in New Zealand, um, not including organic in its name as the Rodell Institute does. So how can regenerative practices be true to sustainable concepts um, without owning that organics is already regenerative? And is, is that a view that you share, is that organics is regenerative uh, by nature? And there's, a, there's definitely a lot of debate around this, so I'm very curious to hear, mm -hmm. hear your thoughts. Nicole, do you wanna well, them? Well, it, it comes back again to this, are we talking principles or practices? And, and really, you know, when you look at the original organic standards and what organics was out to do, it very much was around outcomes and improving quality and mm -hmm. reducing the need for inputs um, and um, yeah, improving outcomes. But then what it got turned into was a set of uh, pr uh, practices. And so what you can find is probably some of the best properties I've been on are regenerative organic and some of the worst properties I've been on are organic because you can follow a set of practices and still not be regenerating and really looking after your resource. So yes, there is the certified organic, um, regenerative organic label coming out of Rodale, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, but by becoming organic, then it rules you out of some of the flexibility, like say you have a sick animal and you want to be able to give it antibiotics. Well, who's to say you can or cannot do that? I mean, I think what I like about regenerative agriculture is it doesn't have the dogma. You know, if, if you need to, um, you know, if, if required in the transition, maybe you need some of these chemical inputs or controls or, or whatever, so that you've got a productive, profitable harvest. There's nothing to say that you can't do that. But are you looking after your ecosystem? Are you looking at, you know, improving it? Then for sure. So, I, I mean, I really enjoy the flexibility. I used to be involved in the organic sector and was really seeing some degenerating practices whereby, you know, um, looking at controlling, there were some insect pressures that were happening in the pit fruit industry. And so they just started to cultivate and cultivate and cultivate and they couldn't control these insects because they weren't thinking about it holistically. Um, and yeah. It wasn't good for the industry. Right. Do you have any thoughts to add there to that uh, topic, Gwen? Um, yeah, by and large, um, everything that Nicola said is like, I, I, I fully agree with this. This is the debate we're having all the time. There's another layer of this that we could probably touch down on now um, is a, a lot of the, the kind of definition and certification framework have come from outside of New Zealand. And... Um, so I'm just going to tell you a, a little story of in my, within my career when I arrived in New Zealand. So you know, one you know, we probably spend as scientists uh, um, half of our time at least is about securing additional funding to do to do research, right? And so we write proposals, and so we have to find ideas, etc., and we have to justify why our ideas are really essential and should be funded. And when I first arrived in New Zealand, having worked in the U.S. and in uh, Scotland mostly, um. The thing that really shocked me was everybody was telling me, you have to acknowledge that New Zealand ecosystems are very different from elsewhere. And basically, we have to repeat everything that's been done overseas. And I couldn't understand that from an ecological standpoint. For me, you know, an, an ecosystem is an ecosystem. It's not because it's New Zealand that all the ecological laws that have been proven elsewhere wouldn't apply. And since I've started to work in regenerative ag, I've started to understand where people were coming from. So a lot of these certification definitions are based upon the kind of evolutionary trajectory of ecosystem and agroecosystem in say South Africa, the US, Australia, they have a very, very different history from the New Zealand ecosystem. They have a different biota, they have different geological, biotic, climatic constraint. And one of the concessions that I think is needed to be had is what, what does it mean to be regenerative for New Zealand? You know, how are we going to handle um, the fact that all of our productive landscapes are relying on exotic species? Are we going to start embracing, you know, producing food using um, our Tongoa species? Are we going to try and, and uh, uh, put more effort in, in bringing native species inside of our agroecosystem as part of the production or outside on, on, the, on the verge of it? What does it really mean? And what's, what about our cultural identity? 
is should this be part of our definition of virginity bag and this is not i don't have an answer this is not a conversation that i'm probably even entitled to have but i'm you know i can ask that question mm. okay fantastic um there's yeah. a lot of uh, sorry do you want to add something nicole oh no just thinking of the the new zealand context when you're thinking of how historically how was soils built new zealand ha never had graziers and we never had mammals except for a couple of bats um, so you think about the difference between a soil that's evolved under forest and shrub and wetlands compared to a grassland ecosystem and you know this this ties into the carbon conversation as well as in terms of forested ecosystems have very shallow topsoil you know all of that carbon's really concentrated in that top layer whereas you look at grassland ecosystems, these soils are incredibly deep with a, a lot more carbon or topsoil to depth. Mm -hmm. So I think New Zealand has a really unique opportunity, but I think that it does involve what Gwen was, you know, pointing to, which is we need more diversity. We need these mosaic type patterns, not just, you know, here's a pine plantation and, you know, here's a dairy farm, but actually, you know, how do we incorporate all that, the, the benefits of what some of the New Zealand natives actually have to offer in terms of even fodder for you know, animals and, you know, there's no turning back. We're not going to go to an ecosystem and go, okay, no, actually we're going to get rid of all the mammals. And actually that would have to include us if we were going to do that. But, you know, like <laughs> we, have, yeah. we have the new natives now and, and how is it that we can um, create ecosystems that, that work and function in the New Zealand context? Yeah. Mm. Can I just add something else in there that's going to be slightly provocative, but, um, you know, pure. Go. Inman Hillary is into the business of being very provocative. Um, so I, I recently visited the U.S. and, and I went to visit, um, you know, uh, regenerative uh, ranches in California. Um, and there is a system there where uh, ranchers um, have easement and are paid to manage the grazing so that they, um, they manage the entire ecosystem in the ranches there to promote um, certain, to promote the restoration and the revival of the habitat that is most suited to some of their endangered uh, plant species. Now, I went to visit these places and basically even the ranchers told me, um, and so I don't have that out there, this is just an anecdote, okay? But basically to manage the habitat so that that particular plant species was revived and restored, they needed, the, the ecosystem in, it, in itself was managed to not be thriving. So the most thriving state of that ecosystem at that particular location would be to actually encourage more of the exotic because the exotic were much more adapted to cope with the current drought flood situation in California. This is another question. I don't have an answer, but this is something that New Zealand has to ask itself. Um, when, when, we are, uh, when we are really uh, managing our landscape to promote and looking after and making sure we don't lose any of our native species, do we do that at the cost of the ecosystem health itself? And this is a really provocative question. It's very, oh, I love it. Very, but, <laughs> and I don't have an answer, but I think if we're not prepared to ask this question, somewhat mm. we are just going to be delusional in what we're doing and in, in our policy uh, regulation and decisions that we're making. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah certainly no, no silver bullet, bullets here. And mm. we're trying to tackle multiple issues with some level of urgency. Um, we, we, you talked a little bit there around um, around trees and natives and, and soil sequestration. I mean, that's something that uh, regenerative agriculture is touted quite often as a solution for soil sequestration. I wonder if you can speak a little bit to um, exactly uh, how that works, uh, what the capacity is, and um, any of the any of the research that's been done in New Zealand on soil sequestration. Are you talking to me or to Nicole? Um, let's start with you, Gwen. Love to hear your mm -hmm. thoughts on, on the New Zealand context. Uh, so there are multiple uh, questions there. There are um, uh, a lot of debates about the fact that uh, New Zealand soils are quite rich in carbon already. They have a high amount of carbon. And um, the, our current of distending understanding of the processes that are driving carbon sequestration. So sequestration means that your carbon is stabilized in a form um, uh, or in a space. So it could be a, just a physical separation so that it will stay there for tens or hundreds of years. Okay. So 
Um, we have found, for example, some highly labeled carbon glucose that is, stays in the, in the form of glucose at depths and is not chewed by the microbes because it is sequestered away. So it doesn't mean that the carbon has to become really complex in its chemical form. It can still be supposing very labile, but if it's taken away and, and cannot be accessed by the microbe, then it is stabilized. So all of the processes, our understanding of what drives carbon sequestration is, we, it's not that we don't know anything. We know quite a lot, but it's still emerging. There are loads of, pro and I, I was looking at it just from a kind of a curiosity and it's only in 2002 when people started to question whether the uh, ability of salt to sequester carbon uh, was driven by something else than the clay content up to 2000, mm -hmm. which is not such a long time ago. We thought that the only way we could sequester carbon in the soil if, if there was a lot of clay. Um, recently, there was a, a paper a study that published last year that showed that if you increase the diversity of your plants, um, you, you, you sh the, the size of the pores in the soil uh, a change and there is a, a sort of a biological and a physical separation of your carbon. So there's much more pores, m many more pores of a particular size that encourage the growth of microbes that will kind of draw down the carbon, the kind of term that Rick and I like to use, but basically encourage carbon transfer from the plant into the, the, the soil biota. Um, the soil biota then decompose that carbon and because they decompose that carbon in forms that are much more soluble, these forms then diffuse and get stored or get put away, not accessible anymore by the microbes. So they might be very labile, very decomposable carbon, but they are stored in a, in a, in a location in the soil that cannot, that it means they can, it cannot be shoot. So it cannot be lost through soil respiration. This is super new and it was, it involved like it was published in Nature, which is one of the most prestigious journal. It involved really, really complex, fancy measurement, you know, no doubt years of research for us to try to decipher that process. So what I'm saying is at the moment we have, we're starting to have data, emerging data that show that if you deploy a regenerative management, you are sequestrating more, or you are you have greater stocks of carbon in the soil. Whether that carbon is absolutely stable is a, a different a different question. But mm. we are we are starting to understand the process. What I think is um, super fascinating is this has given us so much opportunity to decipher other processes of life. I mean, nature is constantly showing off with loads of different processes and loads of different life form that do all sorts of amazing things. So this is really an opportunity to look at all of these different things and testing the assumptions mm. that we made about how the system functions. Mm. So I got a bit excited about that, sorry. No, no. <laughs> well, but I think it raises a really good point and it's part of what's been happening in New Zealand for the last 20 or 30 years that's quite insidious, which is this New Zealand soil carbon is stable and that's the end of the conversation. You know, or New Zealand's already saturated or we're really high. And, what we're seeing is, and this comes back to like carbon is a much bigger topic than just carbon. Like it's what is happening with water, what is happening with gas diffusion, what is happening with rooting systems and soil structure um, and, and production. And so for me, I think the, the practitioners and the farmers and all the rest of us need to just get on with it and, and do it in terms of improving the soil structure because we're talking about functional carbon, which is the the sponge and the powerhouse that really is driving uh, microbial interactions and, you know, the, the soil food web that you were referring to and, you know, what is happening with water. And so just to see some of these functional breakdowns in the New Zealand agricultural system, I think just means we have such a, a wide range of opportunity out there that we're barely scratching the surface on in, in most of our operations. So that's why I think this is, it's exciting that the science is really starting to look at it. Um, but actually farmers in New Zealand have been seeing the benefits of this directly for 20 or 30 years themselves. I mean, there's, there's a lot of producers that have been practicing regenerative agriculture in New Zealand for a long time that we can look to and go, hey, these guys aren't putting all the nitrogen and phosphorus on. They're still growing comparable yields. Um, what is happening in their system? You know, and that curiosity, which is, which is really cool.
Yeah, another of our participants in this uh, series has described that, that healthy soil functioning as a three-legged stool between the soil biology, the chemistry, and the, and the physics, the structure, and how they all work together. So I think you've, you've captured that really well there. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, I mean, what do you, we think about um, the, the role of, of native trees? I mean, a lot of the, uh, the carbon conversation in New Zealand is around planting trees. We've got a billion trees. Uh, we'd really love if they weren't already out of home. So what, what do you, yeah, how, how do you see natives working in with um, other regenerative agriculture systems? Yeah, I think you're right. If I think it was ready out of pine, that would be terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Um, but yeah, again, I think it comes to that mosaic patterning of, you know, landscapes that are that silver culture where you, you might have different types of hardwoods or different types of trees that are performing different functions, which is where the permaculture principles really come into. Can some of these landscapes be grazed? Is there animal health benefits from some of these? Is there water cleansing? You know, it's much more than just a token riparian strip. I mean, we really got to look. And there was some good work that came out of that Raglan um, riparian project that went ahead with Fred Lichwak and they found even some of those farmers who were dramatically reducing the amount of productive land, like some of them maybe by like 30%, still found that they had similar production because of all that edge effect and shade and shelter and all the other benefits that, that the native trees were actually providing, which I think is really, really exciting. And there's good work around, you know, what the edge effect actually provides for production and grass and animals. So yeah, I, th I mean, I don't think we can have this conversation and exclude natives. You know, and you fly into Canterbury and you just see these big open spaces where, you know, where are the trees? Where, where has that, where, where's it gone? Mm. Yeah. Um, I've got a curly question for you, Nicole, um, since you <laughs> love, the, uh, love the controversy. I do. <laughs> um, and there's a, a little bit of debate going on in the Q&A about this. So we'd love to hear your oh. thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, would you please speak to the great deal of research showing that entirely going plant-based in terms of diet, I assume, um, is oh. so much better for the environment, soil, climate change, and of course the animals. Um, so you're so saying for, the for opposite? Food. So if you go a plant-based diet, it's worst for the planet? Is that what you said? Um, I don't, I, I believe that, um, that they mean the opposite. So, um, Oh, I see. Suggesting, so, suggesting that it's better for the environment and the animals and climate if we were to um, adopt a plant-based diet, is my understanding. Yeah. I think, unfortunately, it's like one of these knee-jerk reactions of where we throw the baby out with the bathwater because the industrial model's not working. So we think to solve it that we need to go to a plant-based diet. And I just don't think it stands up at all. And I don't think it's a question of meat or, or vegetables or whatever you want to eat. It's a question of how is that grown? And those are the questions people need to be asking and getting really interested in. So how was that impossible burger grown? You know, like, oh, a whole lot of sprayed out soy beans planted in monoculture and they killed all the insects and the diversity. No, I don't want a bar of that. But, you know, so um, no, you've got to look at, is this an industrial or is it a, a regenerative model? And I think this is what's exciting for me about COVID one of the benefits of what's happening right now is seeing people reconnecting with their local food producers and getting really interested with how is that food growing and um, who are my local producers and how do I get food, you know? And, and like here in Montana right now, like we couldn't get any free range chicken. We couldn't get any grass fed beef in the supermarket, but I could go and find that directly from producers, which was great. Mm. So, so taking the science hat on this in in this in this discussion. So um, there, there's of course there's the you know um, you know building on what Nicole said is throwing um, the baby out with the bathwater, which is uh, there. It, it's no denial that we you know reducing our meat consumption um, in in especially in Western countries uh, can only be a good thing from the human health diet point of view and, and for what's going on with our agri ecosystem. But then going to the, to the point that we need to stop the production of animal-based um, produce um, is, is like, it's the completely, it's, a, it's such, a, such a step, you know, it's like miles and miles and it's such a leap. There was a study, I was trying to look for it earlier, so I can't uh, quote the author and the year, but there's a study that was published two or three years ago, um, and one of my, um, uh, colleague in Germany, 
that show that if you remove the animals, the grazing animals out of an agroecosystem, the agroecosystem actually breaks down. So, and this was in Germany, so this was a European ecosystem and ruminants are part of the, the way the system are being, uh, you know, have evolved. Um, but basically what it says is that for an agroecosystem or any kind of ecosystem to be functioning, you need the animals. Um, so, you know, some... Sorry, and I think too, um, if you consider where a lot of land of where sheep and beef are growing, you're not going to be growing vegetables on the top of the high country, you know, where animals are, um, you know, here in Montana, where I am right now, there's nothing else that grows out here except grass. It's not possible to, to get um, large scale cropping or vegetable production out here. These are the landscapes of the livestock um, and, and they are stimulated by animals and you know we're looking at one of the principles of regenerative agriculture is the incorporation of animals and even in say a market garden or a, um, you know the smaller settings that benefit of still having animal manures is massive like we really see that inoculation by microbiology I'm sure Gwen probably needs the study for that but you know <laughs> we certainly see landscapes come alive from that incorporation of, of having animals in the system. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I just think it again, it comes down to how we're we treating those animals and, and being humane and the low stress animal handling stuff is fascinating. And seeing some of the stuff that I've seen in my travels, you know, I think New Zealand's got a big opportunity to really ex, um, improve on some of the animal management practices. And I think our, that idea of having a free social license to do whatever you want has gone because we have drone technology and we've seen stuff in New Zealand coming up because someone can fly a drone and see someone, you know, what, what used to be, no one needs to know what's happening behind the shed. Um, it's no longer good enough. And I often think when I'm working with people, like what would, what would someone say if they were leaning over your shoulder and they were, you know, from a city and they're seeing some of these practices with animals, like, could you justify what you're doing right now? And I think there are some unjustifiable practices that need to change globally. Um, and yeah, I think that people are becoming aware of that. Mm. Yeah, I think as um, Aaron Crampton, who is another contributor to this series, put it, it's not the cow, it's the how. Mm -hmm. It's also much more about the, um, about the management practices. Um, and we'll be chatting with Aaron in a couple of weeks' time um, in our Lessons from Around the World um, episode, mm -hmm. which Nicole will also be featuring in with another couple of panellists as well. Erin is um, mm -hmm. from Manitoba in the Canadian prairies and describes how in the 70s, you know, every single farm had cropping as well as animals. And it was, it was a system where there was, where there was no waste. Every, every output was an input for something else. And I think that's largely what we've lost. Um, there's a specific question in here that I'd like to put to you um, from Marco Borges. What do you think about biocontrol benefits like uh, Cotesia into regenerative agriculture? I think you might mean Contigo, which um, I'm, I'm guessing that is what you mean, um, which okay. is a, um, there's a couple different Contigo products. They are an entomopathogenic fungi. So they're a type of biocontrol. It's a fungus that eats insects. Mm -hmm. um, there's different types and some of them are very, selective and narrow and Gwen and I were in the fungarium which you know, were down in um in uh, uh land care research yeah, so yeah everyone needs to go it was amazing uh and looking at the native entomopathogenic fungi that we actually have and like there was a wetta that had one growing out oh it was so cool so these are products that can be used to control insects but for me they're very much in that transition because they are naturally in healthy soils so there are, we're seeing more products coming in that can help people through that transition. If you have a system right now that has um, plants that aren't very healthy, then they're going to be ringing the dinner bell for insects. And so in order to get over that hump, we have some of these um, transition tools, which that Contigo product would be one of them. But it's something that we really only use in the first one to three years. And then we should be um, really having a system that's working. Yeah, I guess there's, there's a whole body of... Um, of research in, in the practices and products that have been developed as, as a result of that in the, in the, in the space of integrated pest management, for example, or where you have loads and, and also other kind of biological control to a fungal disease, a bacterial disease, uh, an insect, uh, herbivore. Um, and always what, um, I think it comes down to the principle. D these are tools that are potentially less harmful than a synthetic, uh, 
uh, totally man-made product, chemical. Uh, but in the long term, uh, so I, I don't have data for this, but it, it, uh, you know, it's, um, you, you're looking at your ecosystem. If you want your ecosystem to be balanced and continuing to produce in that state, um, you, you want to try to have a balance between all your different organisms. So if you're starting to manage your system to emphasize one particular organism to dominate completely your community, we don't know yet what, what's going to be the long-term impact of this, which is why I really like it when we discuss this, these topics with Nico. This is really a tool for the transition. So it's a tool that is, it has got so much potential in terms of shifting our, away from using all these uh, synthetic uh, chemicals. But it's also, again, looking at what is the principle and what is the goal of our management. And at the end, we want to reach a balance. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's another question which I'd love to hear a little bit more about, about the, um, the newer practice of inversion tilling and whether there's a role to play within regenerative agriculture there. No. Not, not something I'm familiar with. So. Well, no, I, no. Uh, the, yeah. Um, there's people that, that uh, yeah, are now involved in regenerative ag agriculture that were big advocates of that 20 odd years ago and um, saw for themselves how you really were crashing your system. So you'd get a growth response because you are inverting soil, bringing, you know, rich organic matter, burying um, carbon. And I see that, you know, scientists are probably trying to push that as a carbon initiative because you're going to bury it. But it's, it's another one of our kind of mechanical fixes for a biological problem. And we really need to be focusing on actually how do you get systems to, you know, how do we manage for a system to open itself up and not be resorting to, to machinery? And, and these operators up north that were doing this inversion stuff found within about 30 years, they, they ended up really having soils that, that become incredibly dysfunctional. Mm. Um, I was very disappointed to see that that's starting to be pushed by certain scientific um, sectors. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd rather ask the question really, which is, um, does regenerative agriculture mine soil? Because I think that's often what comes up for us um, against regenerative agriculture. It's like, also, if you're not putting all of these phosphate and nitrogen and everything on, then you're mining your system because you're exporting it in terms of dairy products or meat or, or whatever. And I think um, if you think about our current industrial model where rooting systems are only about that deep, mm. if you are not applying phosphorus and nitrogen, then yes, you are gonna deplete that and you will see reductions in yields. But we're talking about systems that, how deep can that root system go and how much mineral do you have? And if you think every handful of soil is actually mineral, you know, are we making the most of our whole resource? Um, and, and if you needed to use a little bit of phosphate, then yes. But New Zealand is, what, number three on the use of phosphate in the world. We're absolutely pouring the stuff on. Um, and we don't need to because uh, the regenerative farmers in New Zealand are showing that. Mm. Yep, Sorry, I got on my high horse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All about the controversy. Uh, we've just got five minutes left. So I think I'm going to um, grab one more question out before we wrap things up. Um, Interesting question here um, around, you know, if somebody was looking to transition a farm from, um, from conventional to regenerative, and I suspect this might be a, a question of how long is a piece of string, but how much, how much funding do you need as a ballpark figure to, say, transition the average farm? How much funding? Mm, mm. How much, yeah. Very interesting question. So if I think of, uh, if I can just... Um, I can give some of my cropping clients as examples. I mean, you know, obviously some of these guys are really big, so I'm not thinking larger than the New Zealand context, but um, on say a 23,000 acre operation, first year they made a million dollars. Year two, they made 1.5 million. So I don't, I think this idea that you're gonna have to spend more money or have more funding in order to do this is a fallacy. It, and it really is, okay, what, what are you doing now? And if you think about the efficacy of most of our nutrients, like even if you're a really good farmer, still only probably 35% of your nitrogen is used by the plant and the rest is going up into the atmosphere or into the waterways. So a lot of what we're doing in regenerative agriculture is increasing those efficiencies, which makes it more profitable. 
Um, and we need some more studies to look at that. I could go on and on, but when I don't know if you wanted to add. Yeah, so I think in there, um, the, this is certainly a conversation to be had and to had with open eyes. Um, so I'm hearing, and I, and I know some of the, the exemplar that uh, Nicole has, has put forward, but I also, uh, we've just started an economic assessment of, of um, uh, to do with relative ag, a very small uh, number of replicates, uh, i.e. number of farms that we're looking at. Um, th this whole concept of how much will it cost to transition uh, is a stigma uh, arising from the transition to organic agriculture, where in there to transition the system and, and, and wean ourselves off from the use of uh, ag chemicals, it was, there was going to be a drop down in production and money was going to be lost. In regenerative ag, this is not the case necessarily. However, there are many regenerative practitioners that incur a loss in production for sure and some loss in profit in, the, in their state of transition. So the question is, how much of that loss uh, can be mitigated if the transition is better optimized? Can it be better optimized for New Zealand? Um, is, is the amount of loss acceptable? Can it be funded elsewhere? Is there a way of doing it where there's no, going to be no loss and you know, in, increased profitability as, as Nicole is showing? So in, in, in some, some studies shows that the profit increased straight away and some studies show that there is a transition. So at the moment, we don't absolutely know. Um, yeah, so I, I think we need to look. Mm. We need to Which look. is what it comes back to your string question. And there's no one way to do this. And there's, you know, there's no one system. People are always looking for these silver bullets, like just give me the answer and I'm going to do ABC. And, you know, you can go out and spend a whole lot of money on new equipment or new types of drills or whatever it is that you want to spend money on. And it's, um, you don't have to do that, you know, so. Mm. And, and the other thing to consider is like, I think in organics, um, you know, the story of organic agriculture, there, there, was, there, there was this, this, no doubt there was, this has been studied and well documented, there was usually three to five years of transition where there was a loss in profit. And then afterwards, um, and you know, the profit regain or perhaps exceeded a little bit what was there before. But with regenerative agriculture, what, what has been the story, been a report is, is not only does it um, recover if there's been any loss, but it exceeds but a lot if the marketing has been done in a, in a proper way. Then, mm -hmm. so the question then arises to what are the trends, what are the conditions that we need to nurture for this to occur specifically in New Zealand? And I think that's a, a discussion to be had at the entire agri-food system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. And we were, we've got three, three, at least three to five more episodes to dive a little more into that. <laughs> Um, yeah. We have reached the top of the hour, so I think we will wrap things up now. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Um, it's been fantastic to have such an animated discussion. Um, there's lots more questions in the chat that we didn't get to, and um, we may try to see if we can address some of those on the Pure Advantage social media in the coming weeks. Um, we do also have, as I said, a few more episodes left of the series. Uh, next Monday's one will be in the evening, so we are alternating between evening and lunchtime sessions. Um, and next week we will be talking about um, the community and mental health um, benefits of regenerative agriculture. And so we've got um, John O'Fru and Sam Lang from Quorum Sense, and also um, a colleague of Nicole's, uh, Jules Matthews, will be joining that session as well. Um, so that should be an exciting um, conversation. We've also got um, lessons from around the world coming up after that, and then a conversation around inve investing in regenerative agriculture and helping people make that sort of first initial leap, leap if, they, if they do need it. Um, just saying again that um, Edmund Hillary Fellowship has got their cohort eight applications closing. You've got about 36 hours to get into that final cohort, get your applications in, super inspiring community. Um, you can check out more about this, this series on the Pure Advantage website, which is pureadvantage.org. And also the um, Edmund Hillary Fellowship blog is where some of these stories are, which is stories.ehf.org. Um, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, it's been a really exciting conversation today. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Gwen, Thanks for joining for us. us. Thanks to you. Thanks for having us. That was fun. Really appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank we'll you. see you next time. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. <laughs>